Hello, everybody. So um, our goal today is about how to leverage the principles of creativity and be even more creative using AI. Um, our talk today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the context, what's AI, what's creativity. Um, introductions, you've got Brian 1 and Brian 2. We'll tell you who we are. We talk a little about facts research, seven creative principles. How do you bring all this stuff together? Um, and then we left time this time for discussion. Um, but if people have questions as you're going through it, you know, type in, type in the chat a question as we're going through it. And so essentially the context here, the first version of this, we were looking at a question is, can AI be creative? And I think Brian and I both have a strong feeling that AI can be creative. Um, but the question that comes up sometimes in that question is you have two parts to it. You know, first of all, what is AI? Um, AI, if we're looking at it in this context, is about computers doing this stuff that we usually associate with human beings. Um, we could have a really long talk about what AI is, um, but we're going to keep a simple thing. And we're also going to focus a little bit on large language models. And it's important to remember everything we're looking at today, this is the worst that AI is ever going to be. And, you know, we're going to get better and better as we go. And the second question that comes up is what is creativity? Um, creativity is a hard thing to define. Um, I think the best definition comes up from something called Bowdoin. Um, it's something new, something surprising, something valuable. And there's been sort of a move on the right now because when you look at these criteria and you evaluate artificial intelligence against human beings, AI tends to beat the humans. So a guy's come across it, well, you know what? Maybe we should add something to the definition, change things around. So we're looking at two sides of the debate. Um, one, you know, you know, AI cannot be creative because all AI is doing is feeding us back things that we already know. It's based on existing information, so it can't be creative. Um, AI is only a mirage of creativity because there's no intentionality behind it. On the other side, um, some people believe that creativity is simply the search for ideas in the existing idea space. If you need to search, AI is going to be better than any human being in this room. Um, there's some research was done around TRIS showing that, in fact, 97% of patents are already being issued for ideas that exist. Saying, in fact, so that means if 97% of the patents, and a patent is sort of the gold standard for creativity, is stuff that already exists, um, maybe. AI can be really creative 97% of the time, and there's 3% where it's not the right answer. Or, you know, what we see is we see really cool results in action. But the big question is, does it really matter if you call it creativity or pseudo-creativity or something else? You know, the bigger and probably better question is, can AI trigger creativity? And in particular, can AI make your team more creative? And the answer there is a big yes. And how it can do it is by giving you feedback, by doing things that you can't do, and by doing things you don't have the time to do. So we're going to start this after that with a short introduction. Who's who? Um, I'm Brian, Brian Cassidy, uh, the first of the two Brians. I'm an AI for innovation expert, but also an entrepreneur. I've done 11 companies in six different countries. I have a passion for teaching and trying to teach a million students over the next five years. Um, I reached 5,000 last year, which means I have 199 years to go, hoping AI will um, close the gap a bit. Brian. Uh, yeah, so hi guys, I'm uh, Brian Matamore. I have a 23 year old innovation agency called Growth Engine, and we work primarily with medium and large companies to help them come up with new stuff. Uh, it could be new products, but also unique uses and applications of creativity to, to solve all manner of challenges. They could be logistics challenges, uh, recruiting and retention, anywhere they're, where they're looking for new ideas. Um, and I've written, I've become somewhat of an expert in ideation and innovation application of processes, and now including AI. And I've written now seven books, uh, two of which were AI assisted, 
And I'm also, uh, and, and we, so we do creativity training workshops, but ideation sessions, I've led, led over a thousand ideation sessions, uh, 500 focus groups, um, creating $3 billion worth of new revenue for our clients. And um, I'm also a, an instructor for, for Caltech and their executive education department um, focused on innovation. Still on you, Brian. 60 oh. years, you have to admit this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we'd like to say 50 years, but it's actually, in fact, 60 years. Uh, applying, customized, inventing, popularized, successful team ideation processes, which which is important. I mean, we approach the process of helping teams come up with ideas creatively. So we're always inventing new approaches, which makes it a, a lot of fun, you know, uh, when we were trying to name a new ice cream for Ben and Jerry's, we used slang dictionaries in order to trigger the the, the, the big idea, which was snafu. It was strawberries and, and fudge uh, ice cream. And so the name triggered by the, the slang dictionary was snafu. Strawberries naturally all fudged up. But that, you know, that's our process of always being creative about how to te get teams to be more and more creative. So... You know, where we came together on this is actually Brian and I met on LinkedIn and we're talking a little bit about the work we're doing, books we've written and things like that. And we said, look, you know, we're both a bit fascinated with the stuff with AI. And we started looking to say, you know, is there a way to systematize a bit, you know, the use of the ideas, the expertise we have and sort of level it up a, a bit using AI um, based on our books and courses, um, we came up with, you know, three apps, um, AI-based apps, one which is about aligning teams for the future, one is about making pitches, one is a pitch review, and also 112, you know, expert prompts around the area of innovation, which allows companies to innovate faster, more effectively. Uh, and then we put a whole bunch of other stuff together, and this is probably a little bit more work, my work than Brian, the other Brian's is trying to take ideas that have been generated by other people and turn it into tools that you can use with AI. And what we have in place right now is we have a toolkit, which has 265 tools that cover the whole innovation process. Now an innovation process can be described in lots of ways. Um, I borrowed something from my book, which was the line, build, communicate, check, and systematically improve. That could also be plan, do, study, act. It could be the design thinking process. But basically what we're looking at is we're looking at tools that help you at each stage of the process. We look at the first stage, which is defining a problem. Second stage, which is building ideas. Third, which is communicating and checking those ideas. And lastly, is improving those ideas and pitching them out. Now, what's cool about this is a way of bringing humans and AI together and doing things faster and better than you could ever imagine. Now, it's a lot more than just a collection of prompts. It's first of all about understanding the process of innovation. Innovation goes through stages, it has certain principles. You need to know what you're doing before you build ideas. You need to be honest with yourself when you're checking those ideas and you have to do it a bit in order. Second thing we have within the toolkit is some things around the areas, summarization and deep thinking, forcing you to work with AI a bit. Now, we talked a little bit about things that we've been doing, and I'm a little bit more interested in this buff than the other, Brian, but I'm interested in a lot in the facts around what, what is terms and creativity. I'm gonna share a few things really quickly with you so we can get on to the meat of the presentation. Um, there's a big talk right now about, you know, AI is gonna take your jobs in the area of creativity, and the answer is it might. Um, when you look at AI versus humans, um, AI is consistently better than most human beings in terms of generating ideas. Um, in terms of generating ideas of value, and value is something which is useful, AI is better. In terms of novelty, it's better than most human beings with a small group of human beings outperforming. What's perhaps more important is those types of tests are done with really simple creativity tests. You can imagine a test which is in the real world. 
And the real world is type, types of things that the leading consultants are doing. And what they did is they did a study with the Harvard Business School and Boston Consulting. And what they looked at is they looked at the effectiveness of people with and without AI. And what you see here is you have the baseline task is without AI, the experimental task is with AI, and you see two groups of participants. One is the least good consultants and the better consultants. And what you see is everybody gets better. And what you see also important is the less good have a leveling up. They become to the point where in fact, the quality of their work is like the top consultants. And they're in fact, with AI, there's no statistically significant difference between the lower half of their consultants and the top half of their consultants. There's a big but there. And that is AI works for some things and AI doesn't work for some things. When you look here, we have a comparison without AI and heavy use of AI and moderate use of AI in terms of the accuracy of the recommendations that they're making. When the things are outside the frontier of what AI knows, in fact, the consultants using AI performed less well than the consultants not using AI. So there's a difficult balance. It boosts your creativity, but you need to know when it's not a good idea to use it. Yeah, and Brian, I would just add to that, one of the case studies in that BCG uh, Harvard Business School was uh, sort of a case study of where they should uh, devote marketing money against three different brands. And uh, one of the fascinating things, and so, so there was a quote, correct answer given all the case study information they provided. Uh, and what happened was AI um, got the wrong answer in a lot of cases, but what was fascinating is that it did a great job of selling their ideas to the consultants. And, and so the consultants adopted them as, as truth and, and accurate and valid when in fact they were the wrong answer. So, so AI did a great job of selling the wrong answer. I know it's, actually, it's funny because you know, one of the things that you know, biggest use of AI is to be able to make arguments in a convincing way and you know, just what you see there is, you know, AI might not have the right answer, but it will convince you it has the right answer. <laughs> right. And the last thing that I see is a lot of talk around automation. And you know, people want to automate their work. They say, ah, let AI do this stuff for me. Um, typically what happens is you see AI able to automate things to a certain extent, but the results stall out pretty quick. And the smart use of AI is not automation, but augmentation. When companies move in the automation bit, they actually fail and don't do very well. Um, you know, the facts are right now is 90% of companies are investing in AI, but less than 40% are seeing any business gain. The, re the reason for that is not the fault of AI, but it's how you're using AI within your organization. Now, at the bottom line, you know, if we look in terms of creativity, innovation, AI or human beings alone, there's not a clear winner. Some are better this way, some are better in that. What we do see is that when you take human intelligence and AI intelligence and you put them together, you get better results, quicker results, faster results, but there's often failures on critical tasks. If what you do is you think about AI differently and you have you know, sort of a smart AI and a smart AI, what we're looking at is predefined tools, knowledge on how to use those tools and more importantly, training on how to interact, you get even better results and less failures. What we see, for example, now is we run design sprints. We do a five day, what used to be a five day design sprint in two days and we end up generating two to three times more ideas. So how do we do this? What, what would you need to be smart? You'd need expertise in innovation, expertise in AI, expertise on how to put the two together and hands-on application. And it's our belief you can probably learn most of that. And this is the Pareto rule. 20% 20, 20 of the time can teach you 80% of the results. We think 80% of this could be taught to you in a day. Now, I'm gonna flip over to the other Brian.
And he's going to talk to you a little bit about principles for creative success. And those principles remain the same regardless of whether you're using AI or not using AI. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, we'll go through these, but, you know, a, a big part of what Brian started to allude to is you want to make sure you're solving the right problem, right? Uh, you know, clients will come to us a lot and say, uh, the example I sometimes give is, you know, can you help us invent a new iron, you know, ironing, you know, clothes or whatever. And I, and my, and I say things like, well, yeah, but we don't want to define the challenge that way because there's so many preconceptions and assumptions about what an iron is. And so we might redefine that challenge as can you invent a new anti-wrinkle device? And so therefore it focuses on the benefit or we might expand the arena of, of successful inventions and, and it, which is what we did in one real world example. Can you create new garment care devices? So that's about the clarity. We're gonna talk about how you prepare for a session. And you know, in our work, you know, having done a thousand ideation sessions, you know, I might spend a week or two weeks generating the stimuli uh, and picking the techniques and choreographing those techniques for an ideation session. So the preparation is critical. And of course, AI helps tremendously with that because it what? It can help you create really interesting stimuli. Uh, we wanna talk about some of the ideation tools. Uh, we wanna talk about the role of diversity. Uh, there's been tremendous research that talks and shows how diversity, um, and, and I'm, I'm guessing many of you know this, uh, is critical to a successful session. You want very diverse, uh, thinking people and you want diverse tools, right? Um, we're going to share one example on with Triz. Uh, Brian had mentioned Triz before, but those of you who don't know it, it's a, it was a, uh, a uh, sort of thinking methodology, for lack of a better way to say it, developed by the Russian Altshor in uh, the 50s. And he had a team of research scientists go through 200,000, 250,000 patents and identify 40 principles uh, from that. And by the way, you can go into an AI and just say, hey, use the TRIZ, T-R-I-Z methodology and come up with, use those 40 principles and come up with say new products. And I was surprised that, that, that it worked. <laughs> you know, First of all, a new TRIZ, and secondly, it applied those principles uh, very creatively. Um, I was fortunate because I was the first guy in the U.S. to have the invention machine. I was I reviewed it for Success Magazine. This was in the mid '90s, and now uh, there's even a book out there, Triz for Dummies. Uh, Soak and merge is the notion that uh, this doesn't all happen to happen have to happen in an ideation session. It can be over time, and we'll share a technique for that, and then we'll finish with sort of the importance of learning and all this stuff. So we can move on here. This, and we'll get to real world examples here now of A, we, where we've applied it for current assignments or where we've sort of retrofitted it to successful assignments we've done in the past, but saying, oh my gosh, if we had done it with AI, this is how it could have been different. And uh, so this first one, um, clarifying the challenge, uh, this, my, my business partner, Gary Fraser at Growth Engine, our innovation agency, uh, you know, this is a dated example, but we picked it because it's a really good one. Um, he was running the oral care division at, at Unilever, and they had AIM, Pepsi, and Close Up, you know, second, second tier uh, brands. Colgate and Crest had over 70% of the market. And so he's going, what am I going to do here? You know, how am I going to beat these guys? I don't have the money, and, and they own the world. And so they had a, a, a sort of kitchen remedy that they're working on, baking soda and peroxide. Those of you who are older than some of the others may uh, know that at the turn of the century, this is the, the uh, you know, 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, people would, uh, you know, put baking soda in their hand and then pour some peroxide in that brown bottle, mix it up. And it was a great uh, thing for the health of the teeth and gums. It cleaned great, added oxygen, it released oxygen. So they said, well, maybe we can create a product out of that. And uh, Gary was named Market of the Year for creating Menton and Toothpaste. Some of you in the US may remember that. Um, and, and by the way, that, that was ultimately sold off, bought by Church and Dwight, and then they, they kind of killed it. So, but the point here is that they worked through this thing um, because they, they spent over a year um, trying to figure out how to encapsulate uh, 
the peroxide in, in, in the baking soda. Um, and so that when it, when it came to your toothbrush, that it would, you know, um, sort of rupture the, the bubbles or, or the encapsulations, it would release oxygen and, and there we go. And the assumption they worked on, um, and this, that it had to be a sort of chemical solution, because what? Toothpaste comes in a tube, right? And so therefore they kept doing the chemical thing and that didn't work as it turns out. Um, they did a ship test in Georgia uh, in the middle of the summer. They looked at the back of the truck and it was filled with uh, toothpaste tubes that had blown up because it wasn't stable at the highest temp temperatures. So they went back to the drawing board and the point was that they, you know, they, they, they questioned their assumption all right, and this is the key point here, the toothpaste had to come in a tube. And, and so if we had used AI for that, and they had gone through the rigor of saying, well, geez, maybe we should, what are the assumptions we're making about toothpaste, right? Um, and you can see some of the triggers here, which might have led them to what they actually came up with uh, after a year of a, you know, failure, if you, if you will. And, and this was meant to end toothpaste, which, as I say, many of you remember, where the notion was you would combine the, the, the um, baking soda and peroxide on the head of the toothpaste that came out in this dual dispenser, release the oxygen. And, and by the way, this sold at twice the cost per ounce uh, of Colgate or Crest. And, and both Colgate and Crest had people working on this because they saw the competition and thought they were nuts, you know, uh, Brian is an XPNG guy. He wasn't working on it, but his colleagues were trying to figure out how, how can they charge double the cost? And the, the assumption was that people thought of it just as, you know, price per ounce. No, they were thinking they had a bigger frame of it and that if it helps my gums, then the framework here is less trips to the dentist. Um, so that's a really good example, I think, of questioning assumptions right up front when you're doing these kind of projects. So, I mean, the thing that, you know, a little bit is good, so maybe a lot is better. And I think, you know, we can look at a plus solution, which might be to imagine there's a series of standard questions that we might want to ask before we do an innovation process. And in practice, what we've developed is a tool where you take in something about your business mission, what you're selling, the job to be done, and you run a whole bunch of expert prompts and what you get is a question summary. You get some questions. You get a suggested, you know, you know, true north where you want to go for the future. All you need to know is, you know, to be able to start the process. And effectively, what we have right now is we have a series of prompts, you know, you know, some pretty basic stuff, jobs to be done, trend analysis, what does the future look like? But basically what you can imagine is you're starting a project. How do you use AF, AF effectively? You get them to do the stuff that you don't want to do or you don't have time to do. You can run this three or four, you know, 35 set of prompts in three to four minutes. You get new insights, new recommendations. And basically, what does that look like? Um, we have a process where you fill it in, you complete something, you do a click, you wait, and you get a whole bunch of prompts run at one point in time. Now, this is what you used to pay a consultant, you know, a couple of days to do. And they come back with a really long PowerPoint presentation. Now you can do this, press a few buttons and get to go. So, so Brian, um, you know, we, we again, we just want to share some real world examples here. Uh, I'll ask Brian uh, to share this. We've been changing this uh right up until the last minute here. So <laughs> we replaced one example with another. So Brian, I'll ask you to, to, to share this one. Okay. So one of the, one we, got of rid the, of the cancer. we got rid of the startup for a cancer company that's just going into trials and the prompt on that, we were doing strategy sessions and the, the uh, prompts were, for instance, uh, what is a uh, black storm or a, you know, a black swan event that could affect our, our strategies for gr growing in the future. They, they have $80 million of funding for this uh, and they're about to go to human trials. So when we did the strategy session, we prompted uh, or we used, you know, with the board uh, prompts from AI to say, did you consider this black swan event, for instance? So you're, you're getting a twofer here. So <laughs> Brian, so, go ahead. 
Second no, but, but I mean, what Brian's pointing out there is, you know, sort of the superpower of AI is you can ask a lot of questions and get a lot of feedback quickly. Tell me black swan events and cancer treatment. Tell me about this. Yeah. Look at this from this perspective, this perspective, this perspective. And what you can do is you can get food for thought in a quick way. Um, we got some feedback in the last presentation, which was we weren't visual enough. Therefore, I changed this from uh, black swans to event covers. We were doing an event, the event that you're looking at right now, it's called Can AI Be Creative? And we were trying to design a new cover. This cover down here was one that I designed. I said, well, that's okay, not fantastic, but it could be better. And we said, you know, what could you know AI do to help us to try and do this? And we went through a sample set of prompts. Shh. This is not to say that this is the right prompt, but to show you the skill which is there to prepare things. We asked AI, what are the 10 most popular artistic styles? And ChatGPT gave us a reply. I'd like to have help making a cover for a presentation. You know, please design a new cover in each of those artistic styles. So what we have is modern art, we have pop art, we have 50s pulp fiction, we have all these different types of things. Now, the cool thing about this is there's no way you can get human beings to do this in the four minutes that the AI is doing this. The plus version of this is, okay, you can think of the right question, you can do this step by step. But as you look at it, there's a part of preparing an ideation session which is actually twofold. One is make sure you're working on the right problem. And secondly, is once you've worked on the right problem, try to get some ideas coming back that people can build on and move forward with. Um, what we have is a two-step process. One is we have a process where we're looking at, you know, 26 different prompts, which are to look at the problem differently. And those problems lead us to a different view of an innovation challenge. An innovation challenge is essentially, give me a story, tell me what you want, tell me what you don't want, and what are the problems or the opportunities we're facing. Now, what you can do is you can take that innovation challenge and you can take a whole bunch of ideation techniques. And here we have 58. And you know the thing is, it's not, it's not a baker's dozen because there's a lot more than a dozen here. But what you do is you come out with lots of ideas. And what we end up with here is running these prompts. We ask them not to repeat the previous ideas. To give you an idea, we put in something here for Oreo cookies. And you say, well, how could AI give ideas for Oreo cookie flavors? And the ideas are a whole lot better than you might expect. Remember, we came back to this thing about Triz. Um, so we have a prompt. So think like an innovation expert. Try to find meaningfully unique ideas based on Triz's inventive principles. Our challenge, and it was longer in terms of the description, is basically to develop new things that Oreos can do that are authentic in terms of the flavor. And you know, the things that came out, you know, we have Oreo milkshake powder, Oreo capsules for coffee machines, Oreo infused coffee beans, Oreo crumbs for, for your chicken. Now it might be that none of these are ideas that you really like, but we had 1,150 when we started the ideation session. And what you're looking at here is the ability to map out an idea space so that your teams are working off ideas already. Offer to you, Brian. Yeah, and so this is a, um, a real world example. Uh, I had a eureka moment. This was probably six or eight months ago. You know, AI was, you know, becoming known, being used, uh, was in the news. And um, we had had a project to invent a new snack. And so I went to that idea. This was, it was a two day ideation. I, it was with the, the president and their ad agency and all their marketing and R and D people. So it was, it was a big deal. And two days, I mean, we don't normally do a two day ideation, but that's what this was. And so I, I had two exercises that were AI assisted or really driven. And one of them was prompts come up with new forms and the other was come up with new flavors. And so when I started with AI, I said, okay, you know, create a new stack, you know, and generated several hundred ideas. And then I, um, 
uh, you know, and, and with new forms and new flavors. When I got back, for, and by the way, it was very successful. It was great. You know, people were, oh my gosh, that idea, and let's turn it into this. And so there was that building that went on. But when I got back home after I did that session, I said, I wonder how far I can push AI with the features or create, you know, the, the criteria here. And so I sort of prompt one, create a new snack. Then I said, create a handheld snack with a unique flavor combina combination, create a handheld snack that pioneers a new form. And then the last prompt I did, which I thought would, you know, AI would say, forget it, pal, I'm not doing it. Uh, it create it with 10, 10 criteria, handheld, plant-based, healthier, baked, on the go, snack, kids, breakfast, alternative, Pop-Tarts, you know, compete with Pop-Tarts inspired by French cuisine. OK. And I, again, I thought it would say I can't do this. And just next slide, you can see. Um, hopefully <laughs> it's the next slide. There we go. Um, these were just I picked five of these so you guys could see. Um, I particularly liked the nutty croissant roll up, taking inspiration from the classic French croissant. These roll ups are made with flaky whole grain pastry filled with plant based nut butter and a touch of fruit jam rolled into a convenient handheld shape. They're perfect for on the go breakfast, you know, you could say for kids. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? I mean, these are these are pretty amazing starting points if you're doing the ideation work. So um, next slide, Brian. So, you know, I think what Brian points out here is, you know, the value in using AI is, you know, not just to ask for a simple question, ask it a tough question, you know, go one step further, ask, you know, ask things that you really want to know. Um, one of the things that we found and part of the reason why we put together a toolkit with lots of tools is there's lots of things the, you know, large language models can do but you need to prompt them in the right way. You need to get the right information in to get the right information out. And what we did is we identified a whole series of non-standard best in practice tools. And we wrote and explained to the AI, how do you go about doing this? If you want to do a SWOT analysis and you ask ChatGPT to do a SWOT analysis, it can do it quick and easy. It knows everything that you need to know about SWOT. But if you want to do something which is more complex, it gets a little bit harder. So what we've done in practice is we've written up around 100 different innovation techniques, which are non-standard innovation techniques, but really good, explained it to ChatGPT, and then went out and, and do it. Now, where we've taken in a lot of these out of, if you want, if you have a problem sleeping one evening, there's a great book called The Innovative Dictionary. It's 1,300 pages long and it has 555 innovation techniques. And what you'll find is a lot of these give some good inspiration. And what we've seen out of this is by using these techniques, we actually shift the game. Uh, we end up with, with results of higher value. We end up with results which are higher novelty just by prompting different and using AI more effectively. <laughs> So, uh, Brian, you could set this up and then I'll, I'll do the challenge. Uh, or, I, I, you know, you, do you want to mention the formula or should I just go into the, the challenge here? <laughs> you know, okay, so we talked about, about diversity. In fact, something that I like about diversity, and I did a study on this in the university. In fact, any a diversity is oftentimes more important than skill in a group. And the study that I ran in the university is we actually did a study where you add less intelligent people to a group to see if group performance went up. And it did significantly time and time again. And what you're looking at is AI is a diverse member of your team, but it can also take lots of different perspectives. So, uh, you know, a way to use AI effectively is use all the diversity, which is there to ask them lots of different ways that you can work on a specific problem. Okay, does that set you up, Brian? Yeah, it does. Thank you. It's great. So, um, you know, I every month I do uh, the Caltech, I, because I'm an instructor with Caltech Executive Ed, we do the Curious and Quirky podcast. You can go online and look at this podcast. And so we get, you know, five or six instructors from Caltech to talk about what's new, you know, what's going on and, and what could all this mean? You know, do you have any wisdom to share about a trend in, in uh, business marketing, whatever? And so um, this month, uh, I, I, uh, I 
I, I don't know if you know, but there, there's the every year at the end of the year, Time Magazine comes out with the 200 best inventions, you know, for 2023 in this case. And um, I said, well, wouldn't it be fun to take one of those inventions that I like and see how we could line extend that invention? So that's what I did uh, for the Caltech talk. And that's and I just wanted to share that with you. So, um, you know, this machine, the Heinz Remix, essentially will take four bases like, you know, ketchup and barbecue and ranch dressing, et cetera. And these will be available in in in, in restaurants, uh, you know, much like the uh, the Coke machine where you can get 165 different Coke products, right? Um, you know, with a touchscreen. So I took this one and I said, okay, where could we? Where could? Where else? What? Now that we've done this, now that it'll be launched in 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 restaurants this year, where else could you take this thing? And so, um, you know, we had a whole bunch of places you could take it. Um, and, and, and there were some tremendous prompts. One of the prompts, or excuse me, one of the results was that uh, it said, well, you could create your own, you know, uh, spice or flavor or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I, I sort of built on that and said, well, couldn't you build a whole business around, uh, you know, sort of for gifts and, and, and for your home, these, you know, flavors that are created uh, and mailed to you kind of thing. So an online new division with uh, spice creations that you've created. Anyway, so we this is just one example of one of the prompts. It was or one of the results. Ten famous chefs. You can see that. And, um, you know, and not that they would necessarily ever do this, but you go to the next slide and you can see, boy, it gets pretty exotic, right? Uh, <laughs> so there you go. I mean, again, this is not necessarily a practical one, but it, it's pretty interesting, right? And it will get the team thinking differently for, quote, next generation ideas. So I think... Uh, I yeah, go ahead, Brian. I, th I think the opportunity comes up here. You know, we say, look, you know, it, you know, there's... You know, can AI I be creative? And you know, the, within a group of people, it's going to be hard to come up with all these ideas as fast as I mean, this is done in five minutes on AI. And you know, what you look at is this is an interesting team member. It's an interesting team member because he can take lots of different perspectives, he can look at problems from lots of different ways. So he can do things that human beings can't do. You unless you have multiple personality disorder, you can't be 10 different people at the same time. There's also a lot of things that you don't have time to do or you don't have a desire to do. Um, so what you see is diversity, as Brian was explaining, but you can also imagine diversity in the work people are able to do. Um, if you look at, you know, we have 1,200 new Oreo cookie ideas. Please evaluate these according to these four criteria. Imagine you give this to somebody in your company. They're going to leave. But ChatGPT is going to say, yeah, fantastic. We're going to keep on going. Um, you know, here's 20 techniques to make a new name. Give me 400 different names. Ready to go. We're selling X. Um, we're going to give you 2000 classic selling lines. Rewrite our selling line according to all those different ways. Select the best combinations. Put it all together. You know, there's so much more there that you can do when you use this smart. But what you have to do is you can't just be overwhelmed with what is there. Um, yeah. Hey, Brian, let me just, because we keep going to the Oreo thing, you know, we've done work for Oreo and Chips OI, as you'll see, we're going to share a next example for that. But when I ran the Oreo prompts, uh, actually with Triz, and I was surprised, you know, the Triz stuff would work with a, with a you know, a, a food. Um, one of the ideas that I that came out of that, and because I know what the Oreo brand stands for and what the guardrails are for successful ideas, one of them was, um, you know, the notion of using a lattice structure uh, for the cookie itself, right? And, and and that would maybe make it a little crunchier, maybe have less calories in it. So I thought that was a particularly interesting idea. And then the other one that I love that I, I'm expecting I'll see in the market at some place is the notion of an Oreo creamsicle, because you've got the white Oreo filling and orange. And to me, I'm, you know, put them out there, I'm going to buy that. So it's just a little side comment. Go ahead, go ahead, bro. <laughs> so, you know, just sort of looking at, you know, next stage there, getting AI to do things that you don't want to do or have time to do. Um, I was actually running an online pitching course. 
And as part of that pitching course, the editor said, oh, wouldn't it be fantastic if you offered to do pitch evaluations? And I was getting 10 to 15 pitches per day. And I was complaining about it. And I talked to somebody in an event. He said, well, why don't you get AI to evaluate this? And I said, well, shoot, you know, AI can't do my work for me. Um, and in fact, what they did is they created an AI pitch review. And to be fair, they're as good as I am at picking out what is a good pitch and a bad pitch. It doesn't get tired. It gives you a whole page, 20 pages of comments and suggestions and places to look. And it works really, really well. The second thing we did is we put it into some of the courses I was running and we had AI as a tool to help people make a pitch more effectively. So sort of a fill in the blank, like your Mad Libs when you're a kid. And what we do is with these two tools together, which is a review and a pitch maker, we've gone from a 40% fail rate on pitches in my courses to around a 5% fail rate, just by using the diversity of, of AI. Okay, back to you, Brian. Yeah, so um, again, I, I, I be, because I was so surprised with Triz, and I, you know, I explained the background on that. I was first of all, I was surprised that AI knew Triz and was clear of the forty principles that came out of forty inventive principles that came out of analyzing two hundred fifty thousand patents. You can see four of them are listed here, four of the 40. If you're interested, you can just put, you know, type in TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, into AI, and it'll tell you what those 40 are, and you can apply them against anything. Um, this, uh, you know, again, this is a very, you know, approachable example here, which I think makes it fun. Um, the one I focused on here is the nesting principle, with Troishka, that's sort of the Russian doll within a doll within a doll, okay? And so... Let's let's go here. Next next slide. Um, so these were, uh, you know, we did do a, a Chips Ahoy assignment. It was very successful. It created a whole new line of cookies, which you'll see in just a second. But using this, you know, doll within a doll within a doll principle, this is some of the stuff that came out of AI. Again, I'm retrofitting this. We did this several years ago, this work without AI. But these are some of the ideas that came out of this trigger or this prompt and you can see them there and if we go to this this is before ai the big idea that was created using a semantic intuition technique was the notion of a brownie filled chips ahoy cookie and uh the testing on this with nielsen uh was absolutely through the roof we it's one of those times where you kind of know you have a winter winner i was at the supermarket when this just came out and and uh, i asked a woman i saw her buying and i said why are you buying it she said it's a brownie inside a chocolate chip cookie you know like what's better than that and so so this um the food scientists when they figured out how to put this layer inside of brownie inside of the chocolate chip all of a sudden or chips of white cookie all of a sudden you know, it leads to other things you can put inside this cookie. And all of those, as you saw from the previous slide, were anticipated uh, by AI. And these are just some of the line extensions that they've done. Um, and so this has created a new platform for them uh, that, that, you know, well might have been created with, with AI. So you know, there's another part of AI, which is really cool. It's, you know, using AI to think, um, you know, there's an expression, some of you might know it, you know, you try to find people who haven't drunk the Kool-Aid yet. Um, AI is amazing because it's naive. It's willing to ask questions that people don't normally ask. In practice, what we do is we take an innovation objective, we take a solution, and we look at ways we can do synthetic user testing, systems analysis, and we end up with ideas to discuss with real consumers and risks to check. But let me give you a more specific example um, where ChatGP is not only naive, but willing to question everything. And the biggest value is it doesn't bring an ego to the game. So you can put in a prompt, and here's the prompt we gave it. Please identify three reasons why Anthropic is likely to beat ChatGPT in the large language model battle. Now, try to imagine 
talking to a CEO, they're not going to answer this question. They're not going to tell you why their product's going to fail. But ChatGPT starts with this. It has no ego in the game. You can ask it questions about the stuff that you're doing. And you get amazing feedback. All right, Brian, over to you again. Okay. And I, you know, um, I wanted to share this because the notion is that this can be not just one shots. You can work with your team over time using AI as a trigger. And uh, the one I wanted to share here is that, you know, when we do, you know, our creativity workshops, ideation workshops, innovation workshops, I'll sometimes ask the question, okay, audience, what, um, how successful have you been when you've asked your coworkers for an idea? And, and they, not a lot of hands go up, you know, um, and I, and one of the recommendations is, uh, you know, can you be more specific in terms of the question you ask? And AI can help you generate more specific questions. It's not how do we market our product? How do we market our product to teenagers at two in the morning? It's a sleep aid that, you know, is not addictive. Come up with ideas for marketing to millennials, you know, on the third Tuesday. I mean, it's that specificity where your coworkers will actually be able to, to generate ideas. Um, but one of our clients had asked us, they, they, they said, well, can you help our client? This was before AI. Can you help our client or our, our, our guys on the line um, come up with new ideas? But we don't want to take them off the line because that's going to cost us money. And it almost sounds like an impossible challenge, right? And the first place your mind goes is, could you do a suggestion box? And it, it, anybody who studied suggestion boxes as, as we have knows that they have been dismal failures in American business. You know, just there are exceptions. Frito Lay, you know, client, uh, some clients of ours, uh, Dart Industries, uh, et cetera, Toyota have had huge successes with suggestion boxes because they were rigorous about the follow up. They recognized that ideas don't come fully formed. They need to be built on. And they figured out that you probably don't want to be rewarding this because you can get into lawsuits with, with, with uh, like America, as American Airlines got with employees who said, oh, I suggested that idea and you never paid me. So you want to be very careful about when you, um, you know, provide incentives for people getting ideas. It should be internally generated. Uh, wonderful um, book, uh, sort of punished by rewards, talks about this. Anyway, so what we came up with was this notion of a whiteboard, and this could be either virtual or, um, you know, in person. We like the in-person versions. This has been very successful with our clients, very simple. The notion is you put a challenge in the whiteboard, and again, sometimes the more specific, the better, but it could even be, you know, how do we improve customer satisfaction? Where can we improve logistics? Can we invent a new package? Whatever. You put that on a, on a whiteboard in a public place. It could be the lunchroom. It could be in the hallway, whatever. And, and you then put a time frame on that of, say, seven to 10 days. You encourage people to add ideas over time. And that could be ideas. It could be questions. It could be research uh, that they should look at, et cetera. And um, we can move on here. Uh, and, and we found that to be very successful. So... Um, w w this gets to the question, okay? And again, you want to be specific about the question. This is a, a an assignment that I, I talk about on my TEDx talk. Um, it's also on my book, Idea Stormers, but I'll, I'll mention it here. There's a, there's a technique called problem redefinition. Um, we had been called by Catholic Knights Life Insurance. It was the name of the company at the time. It's since been changed. But uh, they had read uh, my book, Idea Stormers, um, uh, or maybe it was 99% inspiration. It was 99% inspiration, my first book. And they said, can you help us, you know, sell more life insurance to Catholics? And I'm answering the phone. I'm going, who is this? You know, uh, why, why are you calling me? And, and can't you sell the Jews and Muslims and Buddhists? And they say, no, 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 our charter is, and we've been sued and it's all the rest. We only sell the Catholics. Okay. So we did a whole bunch of stuff with them when I flew out there to Milwaukee and we, the, the big success, though, is that it's a technique we call problem redefinition, where you find a subject, a verb, an object in your sentence. Uh, how do we, uh, you know, sell more life insurance to Catholics? Now, the object could have been life insurance, but they really didn't want to reinvent their product. So the point here is that you can come up with different options under each of these. The we is typically the sales force, but all these other people could help you sell your life insurance. 
sell, you can think about more broadly, incentivize, give away, co-market, et cetera. And then finally, is a Catholic a Catholic a Catholic? Well, no, you can segment the Catholics too. You come up with this, and Brian alluded to Mad Libs before, and then you do sort of, you can do random or, or directed combinations. And by the way, you can do all of this with AI now. You can ask that question. You can ask AI to come up with the options under each of the you know, subject, verb, and object categories. And then you can ask AI to randomly combine those. So now you have very specific questions, right? And then you can take those questions and say to AI, as I did in this case, come up with some ideas. Um, and the one I've highlighted here, charitable contributions, propose that a percentage of the proceeds from each policy sold will go towards supporting the Catholic school, such as funding educational materials and scholarships. This may motivate families to purchase policies knowing it supports their children's school. Well, that turned out to be one of the big ideas that was generated in the work we did with these guys. Um, and the bottom line here, uh, or the top line, they generated um, a 52% increase in their sales by doing these combinations you know, manually, if you will, before AI to uh, stimulate their teams to come up with new ideas. Another one I liked was they they had uh, grandparents buying life insurance for the new newly born grandkids, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the, the the net of this is AI can do all this heavy lifting for you in terms of especially generating specific questions. And if you put this question on a whiteboard. How could friends of Catholics be incentivized to sell life insurance to Catholic school families? You put that on the whiteboard, or you do it for seven or 10 days, and you get all kinds of ideas because of the specificity. Well, there we go. Okay. Yep. So, so, so Brian's going to plus this up here. So, so, you uh, know, if you imagine here, you know, yeah, you know, the way that you do this, you bring all the stuff together. You start out with the challenge. That's the human beings. You come up with lots of ideas. You score the things. You have AI do this. You do some deep thinking. And you, you're merging stuff, something that you can do that you can't do. You know, in a human brain very well is say, look, I like these three ideas. Combine them into one new idea and make that new idea even better than before. Now, the last part of this is actually looking at what I would call a learning focus. And, you know, the, the thing is, you know, we're, we're old enough, you know, we got our 60 years of experience, but we're still in the process of learning. And you have to sharpen the saw sometime, you have to get better and better. And too often we're asking people to solve a challenge when they don't have the skills. And, you know, one of the skills that your team needs to know is that innovation and creativity is about doing a series of things consistently well. It's about figuring out what you want to do. It's building ideas, checking those ideas, and systematically improving them. When you miss one, when you miss the alignment bit, you end up with chaos and wasted energy. When you miss the building ideas bit, you end up with weak ideas and small improvements. When you miss the checking them, you, you bet put money on bad stuff. And when you systematically improve, you never get big ideas. The action you can take is to learn a little bit, bit by bit. And what I'm looking at is the learning focus, or sort of the plus version, is imagine learning these things in the context of AI. If AI can help you at every step of the innovation process, maybe you should learn them together. So in practice, the basics of creativity haven't changed, just some of the tools to be creative. You can learn the art and the process of creativity like the seven principles. There's 10 principles or 12 principles, however you want to do it. Learn how to leverage AI, but then learn how to put it all together. And what we've got coming up is we've got a new course. It's a one-day course. Um, we're gonna, we've been running these courses over six weeks, one day per week over six weeks. And we come up with a, an, a tough challenge, which is how do we put this into one day to innovate faster, better with less risk. And basically what we're looking at understand how to use AI in the innovation process, apply AI to real challenges in your company and apply it and you get access to our toolkit. Now, we're still in the process of getting this to fit together. Uh, we are looking for companies that would like to do an early access, run a one program at their company and we're offering a 50% discount and frankly, a lot of energy there um, 
they run these type of things. So, so yeah, and, and Brian, I would just say about that, those are per person. So there's different prices for your company, right? I mean, it's not, we're, we're not, not going to run the company thing for four ninety five. We do no, we're not doing that. It's, you know, these are thousands of dollars for, for the, but, but we can talk about that. But, but just so you know, I don't want to anyone to miss Yeah, we'll show, get you guys for my company of 30 people and it's 200 bucks. No, that's not what this is. Go no. ahead. So what we've looked at here is we looked at, you know, some principles, best practices to use AI, better practices to use AI. And what I promised to do was to be done here in time to do some questions and answers. And I've written down a few of the questions that have come in. And what I'm going to suggest is for those of you who want to stick around for the questions and answers, I'm just going to end with a couple remarks. Um, what you can do next, if you want, we've got our AI for Innovation Toolkit up online. Um, it's a beta, you know, as I don't remember what his name, first name is, Reed. What's Reed's first name? The guy from LinkedIn. If you've launched a product and you're not embarrassed by the first version, you're not doing it right. Well, I'm embarrassed by the first version. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You can go to that link, try it out. Um, you select the tools, enter your input, you get some insights, and it's pretty going to work pretty well. Um, the second option, which I think is probably a better option, is we're going to give you a link at the end of the talk here, which is to fill in a survey. We'll ask you some feedback about what we talked about today. What do you like? What didn't you like? How do you do it? And we'll run the toolkit for you. And we'll also give you some other stuff. Um, so going forward, um, basically, we'd love to get your feedback and your suggestions. But we'd also like to take a few minutes to answer some of the questions that have come up. And as we did it, time, we are one minute over time. So we finished at five. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm, I'm shocked. I keep, I keep saying to Brian, we'll never make this in an hour, but we did. So there you go. And so we had a couple of questions that came in. Um, Brian, I'm going to ask you the first question that I saw. Okay. So Brian, Matthew Moore, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge? for people effectively implementing AI in their innovation processes? Now, that's a tough question, Matt. Well, I, you know, I think it's how you think about AI is, is one of the challenges slash opportunities. You know, I, I, I think, and also, frankly, there's been some, some cynicism that has occurred around AI because people have used it individually to write a, a letter or a blog or an email and say, yeah, it's okay, but it's, it's not great. And so there's, there's been some cynicism that occurs out there. And I think it's, it's fair, you know, some of these responses. But what's important, I think, that's critical that a lot of people miss is you shouldn't be thinking of AI as, you know, an answer man, an answer machine. You should be thinking of it as a a, a trigger, a stimulus to help your team get more and better ideas. And so you can, you know, instead of starting at, you know, step one you, and you've got 10 steps in terms of generating ideas, you're going into a session, for instance, at step five. So your team, you're giving them. So net net, you should be thinking of AI as a tremendous a brainstorming partner and B as a tremendous stimulator appropriate stimulator, we, we use, you know, in our process, we call it focused ideation. You're using specific prompts to help your team get ideas, but don't think of it as getting answers. Think of it as generating stimuli to get those answers. <laughs> I like Roy's comment there. We're augmented imagination. I think that's a good thing. Oh, I love that. Hey, can we steal that for the next book title? I love that. Augmented Imagination. Very good. Who said that? Uh, Roy, uh, come on, who? Roy, Roy Villa. Nice, Roy. Thank you. Love that. Um, the AI thing, you know, you just uh, intel you're replacing intelligence with imagination. You know, love that. Um, there was another question that came in here which actually I can't answer. Um, it's about the legal legality of new ideas coming from a world where the data, where AI has been trained on existing ideas. I have no yeah. idea. Yeah, let me, let me just, I'll give my naive view on that. I, 
you know, I have these two AI assisted books. One is quirks and one is quotes, you know, and, and uh, the, 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 the quotes one is, is really good. I took, uh, I took quotes and, um, you know, wisdom on life. I took quotes and then I, I said, take these quotes and then come up with activities to live this quote in your life, for instance, right? Wisdom on life and learning from greatest history's greatest thinker. There's with over 350 activities to help you practice what they preach. Okay. I mentioned that because, you know, I was concerned that I'm, you know, ripping off, you know, the world here by using AI and publishing this book. And every time I went on AI to check, it said, no, you're okay. Okay. So uh, that's my, my naive reaction to it in, 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 in applying this stuff. It said, you're okay with everything you're doing. So again, I, forgive me, that's a, it's a very, you know, superficial note, but, you know, I, it enabled me to write these two books. So there you go. So, um, there's a question here from James, which I'm going to answer. He's talking about how do you, how do you do the job to be done framework with AI? Um, very good question. Um, and we haven't specifically um, bottomed that out, but if I was going to do it, there's a book out there called The Job to Be Done Playbook, which is actually a fabulous book with lots of step-by-step -step and questions. What I would do is I'd put that down on the table and I would try to figure out all the ways that AI could help me through their step-by-step -step process. And I'm sure yeah. right, that you'd have a, you, uh, Jason, James, you'd have a fantastic way to do that. Within our yep. toolkit, we've got about five or six questions about job to be done, about challenging that and trying to find the value in the jobs, which might be useful. Yeah. And to be honest, I've never been a big fan of the whole job to be done thing. I'm kind of like, are you kidding me? You know, it's 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 just a, to me another just another way of saying you know find a need and fill it. But you know, if you can identify a whole bunch of different needs, you you really might be somewhere. Okay, other people. Do you, did you see a question here, Brian, that you wanted to take? Uh, no, let me, I'll start scro scrolling through the chat here. Can we unmute people? Could they, um, could, could they just ask it, you know, as real life people here? That would be much better. Anybody yeah. go up? Uh, can we, can, can people unmute? Are they able to do this? Um, Oliver has to go. See you later, Oliver. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, have you, can you unmute the whole audience here, um, Brian, and, and somebody could just, you know, jump in and ask a question? Uh, actually, anybody can unmute themselves. So they actually. OK. okay. Um, did anyone have a an unmuted question? <laughs> they <wanna ask. laughs> uh, OK, good stuff. Much always happy to chat, connect, da, 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 da. Yeah, Brian and I obviously are, you know, happy to connect with you guys. Um, you know, Brian Cassidy and Brian Mattimore. Or you can just put in Brian and see what happens into LinkedIn. I'm kidding, but uh, yeah, we're happy. We're happy to connect with you guys. And I guess a, no, a number of people want the presentation, which is great. Uh, and a number of people have to leave. Okay, okay. I don't hear any. James, but... you, we have one question. No, yes, thank you. <clears throat> and and maybe my prompt engineering was poor because I think we went down a jobs to be done rat hole. But if I bring it back up, um, I'm trying to abstract from the um, examples you provided, you know, typically consumer packaged goods to the world that I live in, which is designing, you know, fairly complex uh, process uh, support software for industrial customers. And you think about... Um, it, oftentimes there's a regulatory overlay uh, that that constrains requirements, things the software needs to be able to do. Can you just talk a little bit about how you would apply the creative process that you've walked us through today to, you know, maybe refining that software, um, you know, from, let's say, getting it to an MVP to then evolving it beyond that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble making the leap from the example, yeah. which were really good. Yeah, so we, we kind of a world. So thank you for that, James, because the examples were very approachable. But of course, we're dealing, you know, with very different kind of challenges here, especially when you get to the world of process and regulation and all the rest. One thing I would suggest that it, it, it almost seems like a cop out, but I think it's it's valid is to go back to this recording. 
you know, um, type what you just said, everything you just said, MVP, process, blah, 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 blah. Take all of that. And that could be a page long, right? Um, and put that into ChatGPT and, and see what comes out. And then something will come out and you say, well, wait a second, you're missing the point on the MVP thing. So do that. Okay. Well, that's still not good enough. Give me an example in the real world of how this thing could actually work. Okay, but then you didn't talk about regulation. Give me all the regulations that I have to consider. So the point is to to have the, it's like your answer is there, James. You just you just said it with everything or your prompt is there. You said it with all those things you just said and then as you, you know, get are unsatisfied, you keep saying, well, wait a second, this wasn't any good, improve that or come up with 20 options. So really it's your, again, this notion of your brainstorming partner in this. I don't, does that, is that helpful, James? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Terrific. Okay, good. Well, I'm happy because that it's a tough question. I mean, it's, it's a tough question. So J James, uh, you know, just to build on what Brian was saying there, but something that I found works very well, take a report that you've done, make it into a PDF, upload it to ChatGPT and say, look, you know, what prompts would I need to ask to generate this report? And you'll be amazed how good ChatGPT is at reverse engineering the questions you would need to ask to get the stuff that you want to do. Those are two two pretty good answers, I think, from from the Brian Squared team here. I like it. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay, okay. So that is it, guys. We're gonna yeah. cut, close it off here. We we finished at five. We had fifteen minutes for chat questions. Um, and there's one last one here from Pavel, which will be our last question. How do you deal with the unstable repeatability of AI results for the same queries? Isn't that creativity to a certain extent? Yes. Yes. Different answers to the same question. This is actually sort of a proof that AI is creative. Um, and I'd say live with it, profit from it, and may the force be with you and may you have lots of creative ideas in the future. Well, and experiment, you know, come on. I mean, you know, we're we're co-creators here. So we've got to experiment with and and you know, maybe it's different times of day. You know, your breakfast questions and prompts were not great, but you had some soak time and now all of a sudden you have different prompts and 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 what's interesting too is AI will give you different answers at different times of day. So so there you go. So I think you know, just to end off the talk today, I think you know, the thing that's come together. There's principles of innovation. There's principles of AI. Learn the both, bring the two together. You'll be quids in, as they say in the UK, and developing better ideas, which are faster, better, more clever, and take risk out of the process. And we've got to go. So this is it. Thank you, guys. I Thanks, guys. I was here. And if you fill out the survey, I'd really like it because I'm going to learn how to do the last one of these, which is going to be about a month, even better. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great.